Chapter 8 of Astounding Stories 8, August 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Will Staunton in Toronto, Canada. Astounding Stories 8, August 1930 by Arthur J. Banks. Chapter 8. Silver Dome by Harl Vincent. Part 2. Orin vouchsafed no explanations, and they soon re-entered the large building of which the balcony was a part. Here they were conducted to a sumptuously furnished dining room, where their breakfast awaited them. During the meal, which consisted of several courses of fruits and cereals, entirely strange to Frank and Tommy, they were tended by Orin with the utmost deference and most painstaking attention. He anticipated their every want and their thoughts as well. For, when Frank endeavored to ask one of the many questions with which his mind was filled, he was interrupted by a wave of the hand and a smile from their placid host. "'It is quite clear to me that you have many questions to propound,' said Orin, "'and this is not a matter of wonder. But it is not permitted that I enlighten you on the points you have in mind. You must first finish your meal. Then it is to be my privilege to conduct you to the presence of Phaestra, Empress of Theros, who will reveal all. May I ask that you be patient until then?" So friendly was his smile, and so polished his manner, that they restrained their impatience and finished the excellent breakfast in polite silence. And Orin was as good as his word, for no sooner had they finished when he led them from the room and showed the way to the elevator which conveyed them to the upper floor of the building. From the silver-grilled cage of the lift they stepped into a room of such beauty and magnificence of decoration that they gazed about them in wondering admiration. The paneling and molding were of hammered silver that gleamed with polished splendor in the soft rose glow of the hidden lights. The hangings were of heavy plush of deep green hue and bore intricate designs of silver thread woven into the material. At the opposite side of the room there was a pair of huge double doors of chased silver and on either side of this pretentious portal there stood an attendant attired as was Orin, but bearing a silver scepter to denote his official capacity. Phaestra awaits the visitors from above, intoned one of the attendants. Both bowed stiffly from the waist when Orin led the two young scientists through the great doors which had opened silently and majestically at their approach. If the outer room was astonishing in its sumptuousness of decoration and furnishings, the one they now entered was positively breathtaking. On every side there were the exquisite green and silver hangings, tables, divans, and rugs of priceless design and workmanship. But the beauty of the surroundings faded into insignificance when they saw the Empress. A canopied dais in the center of the room drew their attention, and they saw that Phaestra had risen from her seat in a deeply cushioned divan and now stood at its side in an attitude of welcome. Nearly as tall as Frank, she was a figure of commanding and imperious beauty. The whiteness of her body was accentuated by the silver-embroidered and tightly fitted black vestments that covered yet did not conceal its charms. A halo of glorious golden hair surmounted a head that was poised expectantly alert above the perfectly rounded shoulders. The exquisite oval of her face was chiseled in features of transcendent loveliness. She spoke, and, at the sound of her musical voice, Frank and Tommy were enslaved. "'Gentlemen of the upper world,' she said gently, "'you are welcome to Theros. Your innermost thoughts have been recorded by our scientists and found good. With a definite purpose in mind you learned of the existence of the silver dome of Theros, yet you came without greed or malice, and we have taken you in to enlighten you on the many questions that are in your minds, and to return to you to mankind with a knowledge of Theros, which you must keep secret.' You are about to delve into a mystery of the ages, to see and learn many things that are beyond the ken of your kind. It is a privilege never before accorded to beings from above. We thank you, O Queen, spoke Frank humbly, his eyes riveted to the gaze of those violet orbs that seemed to see into his very soul. Tommy mumbled something commonplace. Orin, the sphere. Phaestra, slightly embarrassed by Frank's stare, clapped her hands. At her command, Orin, who had stood quietly by, stepped to the wall and manipulated some mechanism that was hidden in the hangings. There was a musical purr from beneath the floor, and through a circular opening which appeared as if by magic, there rose a crystal sphere of some four feet in diameter. 
Slowly it rose until it reached the level of their eyes, and there it came to rest. The Empress raised her hands as if in invocation, and the soft glow of the lights died down, leaving them in momentary darkness. There came a slight murmur from the sphere, and it lighted with the eerie green flickerings they had observed in the Dome of Silver. Fascinated by the weaving lights within, they gazed into the depths of the crystal with awed expectancy. Phaestra spoke. "'Men from the surface,' she said. "'You, Frank Rowley, and you, Arnold Thompson, are about to witness the powers of that hemisphere of metal you were pleased to term Silver Dome. As you rightly surmised, the dome is of silver, mostly. There are small percentages of platinum, iridium, and other elements, but it is more than nine-tenths pure silver.' To you, of the surface, the alloy is highly valuable for its intrinsic worth by your own standards, but to us the value of the dome lies in its function, in revealing to us the past and present events of our universe. The dome is the eye of a complicated apparatus, which enables us to see and hear any desired happenings on the surface of the earth, beneath its surface, or on the many inhabited planets of the heavens. This is accomplished by means of extremely complex vibrations radiated from the hemisphere, these vibrations penetrating earth, metals, buildings, space itself, and returning to our viewing and sound, reproducing spheres to reveal the desired past or present occurrences at the point at which the rays of vibration are directed. In order to view the past on our own planet, the rays, which travel at the speed of light, are sent out in a huge circle through space, returning to Earth after having spent the requisite number of years in transit. Instantaneous effect is secured by a connecting beam that ties together the ends of the enormous arc. This, of course, is beyond your comprehension, since the ninth dimension is involved. When it is desired that events of the present be observed, the rays are projected direct. The future cannot be viewed, since, in order to accomplish this, it would be necessary that the rays travel at a speed greater than that of light, which is manifestly impossible. Great guns, gasped Frank. This crystal sphere, then, is capable of bringing to our eyes and ears the happenings of centuries past? It is, my dear Frank, said Phaestra, and I would like that I were able to describe the process more clearly. She smiled, and in the unearthly light of the sphere she appeared more beautiful than before, if such a thing were possible. On the pedestal which supported the sphere there was a glittering array of dials and levers. Several of these controls were now adjusted by Phaestra, the delicate motions of her tapered fingers being watched by visitors with intense admiration. There came a change in the note of the sphere, a steadying of the flickerings within. "'Behold!' exclaimed Phaestra. They gazed into the depths of the sphere, and lost all sense of detachment from the scene depicted therein. It seemed they were at a point several thousand miles from the surface of a planet. A great continent spread beneath them, its irregular shoreline being clearly outlined against a large body of water. Here and there the surface was obscured by great white patches of clouds that cast their shadows below. Atlantis, breathed Phaestra reverently. The lost continent of mythology, the fabled body of land that was engulfed by the Atlantic thousands of years ago. A fact. Tommy glanced at Frank, noting that he had withdrawn his gaze from the sphere and was devouring Phaestra with his eyes. As if drawn by the ardor of his observation, she raised her own eyes from the sphere to meet those of the handsome visitor. Obviously confused, she dropped her long lashes and turned nervously to the controls. Tommy experienced a sudden feeling of dread. Surely his pal was not falling in love with this Theronian empress. Then there came another change in the note of the sphere, and once more they lost themselves in contemplation of the scene within. The surface of the lost continent was rushing madly to meet them. With terrific velocity they seemed to be falling. An involuntary gasp was forced from Tommy's lips. Mountains, valleys, rivers could now be discerned. Then the scene shifted slightly, and they were stationary, directly above a large seacoast city. A city of great beauty it was, and its buildings were of the same octagonal shape as were those of Theros. There could be but one inference. The Theronians were direct descendants of those inhabitants of ancient Atlantis. Yes, sighed Phaestra, in answer to the thought she had read. Our ancestors were those you now see in the streets of this city of Atlantis. A marvelous race they were, too when the rest of the world was still savage and unenlightened, 
that he knew more of the arts and sciences than is known on the surface today. The mysteries of the fourth dimension they had already solved. Their telescopes were of such power that they knew of the existence of intelligent beings on Mars and Venus. They had conquered the air. They knew of the relation between gravity and magnetism, but recently propounded by your Einstein. They were prosperous, happy, then, but watch. Faint sounds of the life of the city came to their ears. A swarm of monoplanes roared past just beneath them. The streets were crowded with rapidly moving vehicles, the rooftops with aircraft. Then suddenly the scene darkened. A deep rumbling came from the sea. As they watched in fascinated wonder, a great chasm opened up through the heart of the city. Tall buildings swayed and crumbled, falling into heaps of twisted metal and crushed masonry and burying hundreds of the populace in their fall. The confusion was indescribable, the uproar terrific, and within the space of a very few minutes the entire city was a mass of ruins, fully half of the wrecked area having been swallowed up by the heaving waters of the ocean. Phaestra stifled a sob. Thus it began, she stated. Trovus was first, the city you just saw. Then came three more of the cities of the western coast in rapid succession. Computations of the scientists showed that the upheaval was widespread, and that the entire continent was to be engulfed in a very short time. The exodus began, but it was too late, and only a few hundred people were able to escape the continent before it was finally destroyed. The ocean became the tomb of two hundred million. The handful of survivors reached the coast of what is now North America, but the rigors of the climate proved severe, and more than three-quarters of them perished within a few days after their planes landed. Then the rest took to the caves along the shore, and for a while were safe. She manipulated the controls once more, and there was a quick shift to another coast, a rugged, wave-beaten shore. Closer they drew until they observed a lofty palisade that extended for miles along the barren waterfront. They saw a fire atop this elevation, and active men and women at various tasks within the narrow circle of its warmth. A cave mouth opened at the brink of the precipice near the spot they occupied. Then came a repetition of the upheavals at Trovus. The ocean rushed in and beat against the cliff with such ferocity that its spray was tossed hundreds of feet in the air. The earth shook, and the group of people around the fire made a hasty retreat to the mouth of the cave. The sky darkened, and the winds howled with demonic fury. Quake after quake rent the rugged cliffs. Huge sections toppled into the angry waters. Then a great tidal wave swept in and covered everything, cliffs, cave mouths, and all. Not remained where they had been but the seething waters. But some escaped, exulted Phaestra, and these discovered Theros. Though many miles of the eastern seaboard of your United States were submerged and the coastline entirely altered, these few were saved. Their cave connected with a long passage, a tunnel that led into the bowels of the earth. With the outer entrance blocked by the upheaval, they had no alternative save to continue downward. They traveled for days and days. Some were overcome by hunger and fell by the wayside. The most hardy survived to reach Theros, a series of enormous caverns that extends for hundreds of miles onto the surface of your country. Here they found subterranean lakes of pure water, forests, game. They had a few tools and weapons, and they established themselves in this underground world. From that small beginning came this. Phaestra's slim fingers worked rapidly at the controls. The scenes shifted in quick succession. They were once more in the present and seemed to be traveling speedily through the underground reaches of Theros. Now they were racing through a long lighted passage, now over a great city similar to the one in which they had arrived. Here they visited a huge workshop or laboratory. There a mine where radium or cobalt or platinum was being wrested from the vitals of the unwilling earth. Then they visited a typical Theronian household, saw the perfect peace and happiness in which the family lived. Again, they were in a large power plant where direct application of the internal heat of the earth, as obtained through deep shafts bored into the interior, was utilized in generating electricity. They saw vast quantities of supplies, 50-ton masses of machinery, moved from place to place as lightly as feathers by the use of gravity disks, those heavily charged plates whose emanations counteracted the earth's attractions. In one busy laboratory, they saw an immense television apparatus and heard scientists discussing moot questions with inhabitants of Venus, whose images were depicted on the screen. 
they witnessed a severe electrical storm in the huge cavern arch over one of the cities, a storm that condensed moisture from the artificially oxygenated and humidified atmosphere in such blinding sheets as to easily explain the necessity for well-roofed buildings in the underground realm. And, in all the speech and activities of the Theronians, there was evident that all-pervading feeling of absolute contentment and freedom from care. "'What I cannot understand,' said Frank, during a quiet interval, "'is why the Theronians have never migrated to the surface. Surely, with all your command of science and mechanics, that would be easy.' "'Why? Why?' Phaestra's voice spoke volumes. "'Here, I'll show you the reason.' And again the scene and the sphere changed. They were on the surface and a few years in the past, at Chateau Thierry. They saw their fellow men mangled and broken, saw human beings shot down by hundreds in withering bursts of machine-gun fire, saw them in hand-to-hand -hand bayonet fights, gassed and in delirium from the horror of it all. They traveled over the ocean, saw a big passenger liner, the victim of torpedo fire, saw babies tossed into the water by distracted mothers who jumped in after them to join them in death. A few years were passed by and they saw gang wars in Chicago and New York, saw militia and picketing strikers in mortal combat, saw wealthy brokers and bank presidents turn pistols on themselves following a crash in the stock market, government officials serving penitentiary terms for betrayal of the people's trust, opium dens, speakeasies, sex crimes. It was a fearful indictment. Ah, no, said Phaestra kindly, the surface world has not yet emerged from savagery. We should be unwelcome were we to venture outside, and now we come to the reason for your visit. You come in search of one Edwin Leland, a fellow worker at one time. Your motives are above reproach, but Leland came as a greedy searcher of riches. We brought him within to teach him the error of his ways and to beg him to desist from his efforts at destroying the Dome of Silver. He alone knew the secret. Then you followed him, and we took you in for similar reasons, though our scientists found very quickly that your mental reactions were of entirely different type from Leland's, and that the secret would be safe in your keeping. Leland remains obdurate. He threatens us with physical violence, and his reactions to the thought-reading machines are of the most treacherous sort. We must keep him with us. He shall remain unharmed, but he must not be allowed to return. That is the story. You two are free to leave when you choose. I ask not that you give your word to keep the secret of the Silver Dome. I know it is not necessary. The lights had resumed their normal glow, and the marvelous sphere returned to its receptacle beneath the floor. Phaestra resumed her seat on the canopied divan. Frank dropped to a seat on the edge of the dais. Tommy and Oren remained standing, Tommy lost in thought, and Oren stolidly mute. The Empress avoided Frank's gaze studiously. Her cheeks were flushed, her eyes bright with emotion. Frank was the first to break the silence. Leland is in solitary confinement? he asked. For the present he is under guard, replied Phaestra. He was quite violent, and it was necessary to disarm him after he had killed one of my attendants with a shot from his automatic pistol. When he agrees to submit peacefully, he shall be given the freedom of Theros for the remainder of his life. Perhaps, suggested Frank, if I spoke to him. The very thing. Phaestra thanked him with her wondrous eyes. A high-pitched note rang out from behind the hangings, and in rapid syllables of the language of Theros, a voice broke forth from the concealed amplifiers. Oren, startled from his stoicism, sprang to the side of his empress. She rose from her seat as the voice completed its excited message. "'It is Leland,' she said calmly. "'He has escaped and recovered his pistol. I have been told that he is now at large in the palace, terrorizing the household. We have no weapons here, you see.' "'Good God!' shouted Frank. "'Suppose he should come here!' He jumped to his feet just as a shot rang out in the antechamber. Oren dashed to the portal when a second shot spat forth from the automatic, which must certainly be in the hands of a madman. The doors swung wide, and Leland, hair disarranged and bloodshot eyes staring, burst into the room. Oren went down at the next shot, and the hardly recognizable scientist advanced toward the dais. When he saw Frank and Tommy, he stopped in his tracks. "'So you two have been following me,' he snarled. "'Well, you won't keep me from my purpose.' I'm here to kill this queen of hell. Once more he raised his automatic, 
but Frank had been watching closely, and he literally dove from the steps of the dais to the knees of the deranged Leyland. As beautiful a tackle as he had ever made in his college football days laid the maniac low with a crashing thud that told of a fractured skull. The bullet intended for Phaestra went wide, striking Tommy in the shoulder. Spun halfway around by the impact of the heavy bullet, Tommy fought to retain his balance, but his knees went suddenly awry and gave way beneath him. He crumpled helplessly to the floor, staring foolishly at the prostrate figure of Leland and at Frank, who had risen to his feet and now faced the beautiful Empress of Theros. Strange lights danced before Tommy's eyes, and he found it difficult to keep the pair in focus. But he was sure of one thing. His pal was unharmed. Then the two figures seemed to merge into one, and he blinked his eyes rapidly to clear his failing vision. By George, they were in each other's arms. Funny world, above or below, it didn't seem to make any difference. But it was a tough break for Frank. Morganatic marriage and all that. No chance. Well, Tommy succumbed to his overpowering drowsiness. The awakening was slow, but not painful. Rather, there was a feeling of utter contentment, of joy at being alive. A delicious languor pervaded Tommy's being as he turned his head on a snow-white silken pillow and stared at the figure of the white-capped nurse, who was fussing with the bottles and instruments that lay on an enameled table beside the bed. Memory came to him immediately. He felt remarkably well and refreshed. Experimentally, he moved his left shoulder. There was absolutely no pain, and it felt perfectly normal. He sat erect in his surprise and felt the shoulder with his right hand. There was no bandage, no wound. Had he dreamed of the hammer blow of that forty-five caliber bullet? His nurse, observing that her patient had recovered consciousness, broke forth in a torrent of unintelligible Theronian, then rushed from the room. He was still examining his unscarred shoulder in wonder when the nurse returned with Frank Rowley at her heels. Frank laughed at the expression of his friend's face. "'What's wrong, old-timer?' he asked. "'Why, I thought that fool of a Leland had shot me in the shoulder,' stammered Tommy. "'But I guess I dreamed it. Where are we? Still in Theros?' "'We are,' Frank sobered instantly, and Tommy noted with alarm that his usually cheerful features were haggard and drawn, and his eyes hollow from loss of sleep. "'And you didn't dream that Leland shot you. That shoulder of yours was mangled and torn beyond belief. He was using soft-nosed bullets, the hellhound.' "'Then how—' Tommy, these Theronians are marvelous. We rushed you to this hospital, and a half-dozen doctors started working on you at once. They repaired the shattered bones by an instantaneous grafting process, tied the severed veins and arteries, and closed the gaping wound by filling it with a plastic compound and drawing the edges together with clamps. You were anesthetized, and some ray machine was used to heal the shoulder. This required but ten hours, and they now say that your arm is as good as ever. How does it feel? Perfectly natural. In fact, I feel better than I have in a month. Tommy observed that the nurse had left the room, and he jumped from his bed and capered like a schoolboy. This drew no sign of merriment from Frank, and Tommy scrutinized him once more in consternation. And you? he said. What's wrong with you? Don't worry about me, replied Frank impatiently. Then, irrelevantly, he said, Leland's dead. Should be. I knew we shouldn't have started out to help him. But, Frank, I'm concerned about you. You look badly. Tommy was getting into his clothes as he spoke. Forget it, Tommy. You've been sleeping for two days, you know, part of the cure, and I haven't had much rest during that time. That is all. It's that Phaestra woman, Tommy accused him. Well, perhaps, but I'll get over it, I suppose. Tommy, I love her, but there's no chance for me. Haven't seen her since the row in the palace. Her council surrounds her continually, and I have been advised today that we are to be returned as quickly as you are up and around. That means immediately now. Good. The sooner the better. And you just forget about this queen as soon as you're able. She's a peach, of course, but not for you. There's lots more back in little old New York. But Frank had no reply to this sally. There came a knock at the door, and Tommy called, Come in. I see you have fully recovered, said the smiling Theronian who entered at the bidding, and we are overjoyed to know this. You have the gratitude of the entire realm for your part in the saving of our empress from the bullets of the madman. I? Yes, you and your friend. And now, may I ask, are you ready to return to your own land? Tommy stared. Sure thing, he said. Or rather, I will be in a few minutes. Thank you. We shall await you in the transmitting room. 
The Theronian bowed and was gone. Well, I like that, said Tommy. He hands me an undeserving compliment and then asks how soon we can beat it. Uh, here's your hat, what's your hurry, sort of thing. It's me they're anxious to be rid of, remarked Frank, shrugging his broad shoulders, and perhaps it is just as well. You bet it is, agreed Tommy enthusiastically, and I'm in favor of making it good and snappy. He completed his toilet as rapidly as possible, and then turned to face the downhearted Frank. How do we go? The way we came? he asked. No, Tommy, they've closed off the shaft that led from the cavern of the Silver Dome. They're taking no more chances. It seemed that the shaft down which we floated was constructed by the Theronians, not by Leland. They had used it and the gravity disk to transport casual visitors to the surface, who occasionally mixed with our people in order to learn the languages of the upper world and to actually touch and handle the things they were otherwise able to see only through the medium of the Silver Dome and the Crystal Spheres. Further visits to the surface are now forbidden, and we are to be returned by a remarkable process of beam transmission of our disintegrated bodies. Disintegrated? Yes, it seems they've learned to dissociate the atoms of which the human body is composed, and to transmit them to any desired point over a beam of etheric vibrations, then to reassemble them in the original living condition. What, you mean to say we are to be shot to the surface through the intervening rock and earth? Disintegrated and reintegrated? and will not even be bent, let alone busted? This time he was rewarded by a laugh. That's right, and I have gone through the calculations with one of the Theronian engineers and can find no flaw in the scheme. We're safe in their hands. If you say so, Frank, it's okay with me. Let's go. Reluctantly, his friend lifted his athletic bulk from the chair. In silence, he led the way to the transmitting room of the Theronian scientists. Here they were greeted by two savants with whom Frank was already acquainted, Clarex and Ronus by name. A bewildering array of complex mechanisms were crowded into the high-ceilinged chamber, and, prominent among them, was one of the crystal spheres, this one somewhat smaller than the one in the palace of Phaestra. "'Where do you wish to arrive?' asked Clarex. As near to my automobile as possible, replied Frank, taking sudden interest in the proceedings. It is parked in the lane between Leland's house and the road. Tommy looked quickly in his direction, encouraged by the apparent change in his attitude. The scientists proceeded to energize the crystal sphere. They were bent upon speeding the parting guests. Their beloved empress was to be saved from her own emotions. Quick adjustments of the controls resulted in locating Frank's car, which was still buried to its axles in snow. The scene included Leland's house, or rather its site, for it appeared to have been utterly demolished by some explosion within. Tommy raised questioning eyebrows. It was necessary, explained Ronus, to destroy the house in obliterating all traces of our former means of egress. It has been commanded that you two be returned safely, and we are authorized to trust implicitly in your future silence regarding the existence of Theros. This is satisfactory, I presume? Both Tommy and Frank nodded agreement. "'Are you ready, gentlemen?' asked Clarex, who was adjusting a mechanism that resembled a huge radio transmitter. Its twelve giant vacuum tubes glowed into life as he spoke. "'We are,' chimed the two visitors. They were requested to step to a small circular platform that was raised about a foot from the floor by means of insulating legs. Above the table there was an inverted bowl of silver in the shape of a large parabolic reflector. There will be no alarming sensations, averred Clarex. When I close the switch, the disintegrating energy from the reflector above will bathe your bodies for a moment in visible rays of a deep purple hue. You may possibly experience a slight momentary feeling of nausea. Then, presto, you have arrived. Shoot, growled Frank from his position on the stand. Clarex pulled the switch, and there was a murmur as of distant thunder, Tommy blinked involuntarily in the brilliant purple glow that surrounded him. Then all was confusion in the transmitting room. Somebody had rushed through the open door, shouting, Frank! Frank! It was the Empress Phaestra. In a growing daze, Tommy saw her dash to the platform, seize Frank in a clutch of desperation. There was a violent wretch, as if some monster were twisting at his vitals. He closed his eyes against the blinding light, then realized that utter silence had followed the erstwhile confusion. He sat in Frank's car, alone. The journey was over, and Frank was left behind. With awful finality, it came to him that there was nothing he could do. It was clear that Phaestra had wanted his pal, needed him, come for him. 
From the fact that Frank remained behind, it was evident that she had succeeded in retaining him. A sickening fear came to Tommy that she had been too late, that Frank's body was already partly disintegrated, and that he might have paid the price of her love with his life. But a little reflection convinced him that if this were the case, a portion of his friend's body would have reached the intended destination. Then, unexplainably, he received a mental message that all was well. Considerably heartened, he pressed the starter button, and the cold motor of Frank's coupe turned over slowly, protestingly. Finally, it coughed a few times, and after considerable coaxing by use of the choke, ran smoothly. He proceeded to back carefully through the drifts toward the road, casting an occasional regretful glance in the direction of the demolished mansion. He would have some explaining to do when he returned to New York. Perhaps, yes, almost certainly, he would be questioned by the police regarding Frank's disappearance, but he would never betray the trust of Phaestra, who indeed would believe him if he told the story. Instead, he would concoct a weird fabrication regarding an explosion in Leland's laboratory of his own miraculous escape. They could not hold him, could not accuse him of murder without producing a body, the corpus delecti, or whatever they called it. Anyway, Frank was content, so was Phaestra. Tommy swung the heavy car into the road and turned toward New York, alone and lonely, but somehow happy, happy for his friend. End of chapter 8 Recording by Will Staunton in Toronto, Canada.